like that song. I like the music. And I like the words. And uh, I like the words because they're biblical, first off. I like the words because they speak to my heart. <clears throat> Should speak to your heart. Same word also. But uh, I like the words. And uh, then I like the music. Music reminds me of if you've ever been up to Cherokee. And uh, we, we used to live up that way. But before we ever lived up that way, we used to go up there and go on vacation. And I always like when we go into these stores, you know, they had the Indian music playing. And that sounds very much like some of their music. And uh, we bought one city up there that was singing gospel songs, the Indians. And I think we still got it. And uh, sing Amazing Grace and different songs. And it's just real pretty. And so uh, I, I like their, uh, their music. And so anyway, appreciate that, Brother Fred. Take the Bible. Turn to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 3. Revelation. You want to turn there? Book of Revelation. Please continue to pray for others, pray for our police officers. Pete's going into police force gets still going into it <laughs> and uh, pray for him pray for brother Tim this morning never know yeah. and so uh, what crazy idiot might come flying through there with a machine gun or uh-huh. saw a shotgun or something so uh, to pray for him and uh, pray for our uh, police officer whether you like him or not it'll make no difference the first person I will call when I have to shoot somebody is the police and uh well, you know, if I can't get my gun or I can't get help, uh, then I'm going to call the police, whether I like them or not. Whether they do a great job, it don't make a difference. That's who you're going to call to, to be honest. And so, uh, you know, they're not perfect. Ain't a preacher alive perfect. Ain't a police officer perfect. And so, uh, uh, but appreciate what they do. Yeah, we're living certainly in the last days. And that's what we actually talked about this morning. And so, the title of the message this morning is what is your temperature what is your temperature Hmm. in verse 14 of chapter 3 it says and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things saith the amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. According to Scripture, there are only three possible answers to the question, of the, to the title of the message. What is your temperature? According to Scripture here, you only can have one of three answers. You can be hot, you can be cold, or you can be lukewarm. Now let me ask you this morning, who makes up the body of Christ? Who makes up the body of Christ? The church. That's saved individuals. Not saved baptized individuals. Saved individuals. Notice I didn't say who makes up church membership. Church membership is totally different than those that are in Christ. Talking about church membership, in order to be a church member, you got to be saved, baptized, and, um, and that's what you got to be. But we're talking about being in Christ. Baptism has nothing to do with whether or not you're in Christ or not. But in order to be in Christ, you have to be saved. You have to be a believer in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. If you were to go over there and turn, as I've done several times since over the months, you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you'll notice in verses 1 through 3, 4, when Paul says, the gospel that I preached, I delivered first unto you, and so forth, he never mentions baptism. You know what? Because it's not included. So to be in the body of Christ, to be in the church, you have to be a believer. Plain and simple. That's what makes up a New Testament church. You must be a believer. I'm sure you've heard or 
probably most of you have heard the old saying, as the home goes, so goes the church. You may have heard that. As the home goes, so goes the church. Our church is made up of homes. Whether well, you be a single person, a widow lady, uh, uh, whether you be just, uh, no, just a husband and wife with no kids or you are beyond kids and, or whatever you are or about to be married. You know what? You make up homes. You make up homes. And these homes make up the church. Well, you say the same thing about individuals. Brother Fred's an individual. He has a home though. Pat's an individual. Stephanie's an individual. Each of us are individuals. You could say, as the individual goes, so goes the church. Because it's individual believers who make up the body of Christ. Now, I've told you before, and I'll just repeat it just for the sake of repeating it. This is not one of Christ's bodies of Christ. Okay? And another one over at Calvary, another one over at Bible Baptist, another one over at Tabernacle, another one. Christ has one body. Okay. If they're believers over there, they're part of the same body. This isn't the body of Christ. This is we are members of his body. Different church, different church name, I have different doctrinal statements over. But we're still a part of the body of Christ. So, this morning, we make up the church. As the home goes, so goes the church. So I ask you as an individual, I ask you as a man, the, the head of the household, just like Christ is the head of the church, what's the temperature of your home? You, if you're not married, then you ask yourself, ladies, What's the temperature of your home? Individual. You're a young person. You live at home with mom or dad or you're living on your own or whatever. Ask yourself, what is my temperature? What is your temperature? Spiritually speaking, you're either one of these three. You're either hot this morning, cold this morning, or lukewarm. There's no other option. She's hot. She's fat. <laughs> 69. <laughs> what else to do? So, where are you? Ask yourself. Now, if we're probably like most good Baptists, and we're not being honest like most good Baptists, we probably probably a little self-righteous and think we're better than others and better than most. And, and we probably would, if we had to measure our temperature this morning, then we would probably give ourselves a better score than we really are. Let's just be honest. You say, well, you know, I'm not all that bad. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm not as bad as that guy that shot kill, or shot 12 police officers. I'm not that bad. I'm not near as bad as, as a pedophile. I'm not near as bad as a drunkard. Or, you know, so I, I'd say I'm pretty not. You know, that's what, what I'm, I'm, I'm up there drunk. Where everybody knows what this thing is, right? Mm-hmm. A temperature thing. Where'd you learn that from, Grandma? Grandma? Mom? Okay. I learned it from my grandma up to the mama. But anyway. Temperature thing. There you go. I got a temperature thing here, Grandma. <laughs> Would you have called him a different thing? <laughs> get, I would get him in trouble with his brain with my mom. And so we don't want to do that. So anyway, this temperature thing here, a thermometer, it tells you temperature. I got it upside down right now. Right now, according to this thing, which I've been holding, it, and I'm very hot, Jess. Um, it says I'm 73. Okay, so. Talking about doing too hot. But anyway, very nice. Right well, actually, I'm sorry. But I said it, it tells you when things are too hot, when things are too cold, when things are lukewarm. You know, you got the other kind that when you're cooking, you put, put, put that thing down in the center of your meat and all that. That's the same thing, just a different kind. This different kind, you're supposed to hang in, in a refrigerator. 
or a freezer, or whatever. It's got a book on it, all that kind of good stuff. You got some that you stick in your mouth, and then you got some you stick, you know. <laughs> so anyway, so you can stick that where you want to. But anyway, uh, so there's different kinds that you do different things with. But they all do the same thing. It's called a temperature thing. No matter where you stick, it's a temperature thing. And it gives you temperature. It measures temperature. Now, what if we were to stick one in your mouth? You would get a, a reading of your physical human body temperature. Now, what is the perfect temperature? It's 98.6. 98. 98. Okay, 98.6. And so, if I were to stick this in your mouth, Dustin, I wonder if you would get a 98.6. No, you're not very normal, according to your family. <laughs> Most of us are bigger than that. So anyway. so anyway, where would you be? You know, again, the, the, the average temperature for a human body is 98.6. That would be average. A high temperature, according to what I found, is not considered high until it gets over 100. 100.4. A cold temperature is starts anywhere from 91 on down. And what I found out is a low temperature is just as dangerous as a hot temperature. You want to kill you. But these verses, according to the Bible, spiritually speaking, God desires that we be hot or cold. One of the two. Rather than being lukewarm. But according to God, the Laodicean church here was not hot and they wasn't cold. They were lukewarm. This here is talking about the Laodicean church, which which was a literal, physical, earthly church during the time of the apostles. Turn over to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. In all indication, we're going to come back to Revelation, so just hold your place there. If uh, you have a hard time finding it, just stick a piece of paper in it. We'll come back to it in just a second. Over in Colossians, chapter 2, there's good indication in Scripture, at least there's no indication that the church of Laodicea was a bad church at the time of Paul's writings. If you notice, at least in my Bible, which I, I like mine, I like it better than Schofield's for a lot of different reasons, but I won't get into right now. But uh, Colossians is written around 64 A.D. If you look here in chapter 2, in chapter 2 and verse 1, notice what Paul here says about the Laodicean church, talking to the church of Colossae. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Look over at chapter 4. Chapter 4. And let's see, I guess we'll begin reading... Uh, let's begin reading right here in verse... Uh, Twelve, I guess. I think that's where I want to be. Verse twelve. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that he might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and for them that are in Laodicea. Here, Laodicean is mentioned again that Epaphras, who is one of the Colossians, had a great zeal for those believers in Laodicea and them in here, Paulus, I guess. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, greet you. Salute the brethren. Salute the brethren, that saved individuals. 
which are in Laodicea. I'm talking about the church there in Laodicea. And Nymphus, which was a person. And the church, which is in his house. And when this epistle is read, I'm talking about the, the epistle of the Colossians, among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So obviously, Paul had written a, an epistle to the church in Laodicea. Now, it's not considered Scripture. Everything Paul wrote was not considered Scripture. But he wrote an epistle to the church of Laodicea, just like he wrote a, an epistle to the church in Ephesus and Galatia and Thessalonica and so forth. He wrote an epistle to them. And so Paul was saying, hey, there's not, if you notice here, he doesn't say anything negative against the church of Laodicea. He doesn't say, hey, let me deal with one of these problems. Or they're a problem. Paul did that constantly. You know, Paul was a very shy man. He was afraid to mention problems. I'm joking. No, no, no. He was not afraid. He was not scared. He was very open with dealing with church problems. You don't believe he read through First and Second Corinthians. You know, he did that in the book of Romans. You know, did, and he would name people. In the book of Timothy, before uh, before his death, he named people. He said, be careful of this one. This one happened. Forsaken me and so forth. Alexander the Congress. He did it great. You know, he was not afraid to name your name. So you wouldn't want to get on Paul's most holy list, so to speak. Because he would name it. So if there was a problem in Laodicea in 1964, or 64, I'm sorry, not 19. <laughs> in 64 AD, then he would have mentioned it. Now turn back over to the book of Revelation. Now the book of Revelation here is written around 96 AD. That's only 32 years later that the Laodicean church had no problem. I ain't saying that it was a perfect church. I'm not saying they had any problems. I'm talking about doctrinal problems. Don't you think for one minute the Apostle Paul would not have addressed doctrinal issues that the Laodicean church had issues? In 64 AD, Paul did not address those issues because there were no issues. Just like in the book of uh, Philippians. You won't find one thing that Paul addresses in that church because it wasn't any. He just encouraged them and, and, and just thanked them for their generosity and he, and he praised them and, and because of what God was doing there and their, um, and their giving and, their, and so forth and their joy. But within just 32 years, the Laodicean church, when Paul was on this earth and still living, they were a vibrant, growing church like the church age of the Philadelphian church. Right before the Laodicea church. Which started around 1611 and went up to about 1880. The Laodicean church age, which is what we're living in. Yes, it was a literal, physical church at that time. But what it represents, it is prophecy. It is prophecy to tell us of the times that we live in today. It started around 1881 when the Revised Standard Version was put out. And it will continue until the rapture of the body of Christ, the church. So therefore, we're still living in the Laodicean church. But the Laodicean church that was here, that Paul was here, was a vibrant, growing church that was on fire for God. That was doing things for God. They were movers and shakers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was their spiritual temperature, or Paul would have dealt with their problems. But just 32 years later, in 96 AD, just 32 years later, what happens? Jesus says that you're not hot and you're not cold. You're lukewarm. So they've gone from being a, a hot church to a lukewarm church. 
And God said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth because you make me sick. That is the church age that we're living in today. That's it. That's what we have in our churches. Not when you speak of the world and what's going on in our world today. And every time you turn on the news, there's a new shooting, a new bombing, there's a new this, that, or the other thing going on. But we live in the last days. And so well, they've been saying that for years. You're right. That will show you how much closer it is to us. Paul really thought that he was in the last days when he wrote. But now that Paul didn't understand God's time thing. There's seven days in God's time thing. And we're in the sixth day. At the midnight hour. We're at the midnight hour. There's four watches in the night. God says He'll come back in the last watch, which is from 3 a.m. to 6. That's when He's coming. The Bible tells you that, if you know your Scripture. So we as a church, where are we at spiritually? This church has been here 33 years. Where has it come from? When it started, was it hot? And growing and vibrant and people coming and people getting saved? Where is it at today? If God had to take our spiritual temperature, well, how do you do that? You take your own spiritual temperature. You put a thermometer in your mouth and say, where am I at? Because where you are is where the church is. Because you are the church. The body of Christ. Look at your own spiritual life, for example. Where was you at 32 years ago? Where was you at 40 years ago? 50 years ago? 20 years? I ain't talking about physically. Where was you living and all that kind of stuff? What were you doing? I'm talking about spiritually. Where was you at? If there was a time in your life that you was like the Laodicean church and that you was on fire for God and that you served God more vibrant than you are today, they will tell you about your temperatures. If you say, well, you know, there was a time in my life I used to read more of God's Word, or well, what does that mean about you today? If there was a time in your life when you used to witness more and talk to people more about Christ, what does that say about which, where you are today? That means your temperature has come down, it's dropped. Where are you at? If there was a, more, a time in your life when you were more faithful to the house of God, you, and today you're not. Why is that? Did God change? No. God's house is still here. God's law has not changed. God's thermometer has not changed. His book, there's the temperature gauge. God's Word. He has to change His Word. Was there a time in your life when you memorized Scripture, but you said, you know, I just can't do it now. I am just too busy. I did talk to you years ago. You want something done, you talk to a busy person. A person ain't got nothing to do and they're lazy and they don't sit around and do nothing. Don't ask them to do anything because they won't get anything done. You want something done? Call this and that. That's how you get something done. You call somebody this. Busy, 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 busy. You go in that horror store, she's got 14 things going on. The phone's ringing, she's dealing with three people, got somebody on the intercom, got somebody on hold. She's dealing with a customer, checking them out, and she's ordering something. You know. You, who do you think you ought to get? Somebody standing around doing anything, wait for a customer to come in? No. Go talk to her. That's how you get something done. I was in there the other day asking for something. Oh, no, but no. Oh. Ask her, yep, we got the effort. And went right back here. You, know. you want something done, you ask a busy person. Well, there are times in your life when when you should